welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I, some of you will have heard this before, but uh, I gotta, in case there's even one new person, got to say it. So welcome to the Startup, which is part of the Festival of Live Digital Art, which is here uh, in Kingston, Ontario at Queen's University. And I uh, just want to start uh, from by shouting out Ingenuity Labs for hosting us here. We really appreciate this partnership. Uh, as a festival that's looking into digital technologies and how they combine with live performance to have a partnership with a lab that has uh, so many smart people and so many incredible resources, it really allows us to do like a deep dive exploration. And it's just a really awesome place to have conversations like the one we're having today. So thank you so much, Ingenuity Labs. Uh, so today's panel, uh, I can't remember, we, we had a whole bunch of different names, but like basically what we wanted to do today was have a conversation that was about real world applications of artificial intelligence in performance. Obviously AI is a huge force in society all of a sudden and there's a lot of like ideas and white papers about how these tech can work, but we really wanted to talk about like, oh, tangible examples, like what is actually happening with art makers and this technology. And so uh, we have three incredible guests today who can speak to that. Uh, on the far end here we have Cole Lewis. Cole is an uh, associate professor at TMU. Uh, David Rokeby, who runs the, I wrote it down, BMO Lab for Creative Research in the Arts, Performance, Emerging Technologies, and AI at <laughs> University of Toronto. At the Center for Drama, Theater, and Performance. Okay, studies. I, it's a cool place. We're going to talk about it. Uh, and then, of course, I have Stephen O'Connell to my right. He's here with Blue Mouth Inc. And also uh, should note that they have their piece opening today at the Isabel Bader Center for the Performing Arts in the Art and Media Lab. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about. That's who's here. The format of what we're going to do for the next hour and 50 minutes is we're just going to chat for the first uh, 30 to 45 minutes about these projects and what's going on. We'll take a, we'll play a short video at the end of that. Um, then we're going to take a break, like maybe 5 to 10, and then we're going to come back and David and Cole have examples of the work that they're doing and they can show it to us and maybe a few lucky volunteers can hop up and, and try to use them themselves. So that's what we're going to do here. So I'm going to start, uh, I didn't mention this, but the rules are you guys get to share a mic and we get to share a mic. Uh, so uh, to get started, I wonder if each of you could just explain um, what your project is and why you started it. David, the answer would be a bit different for you because your project is to run a research center. Hello, I'm Stephen. Um, <clears throat> uh, the project we're working on is called Lucy AI. Um, I belong to a collective that's Toronto-based uh, of uh, interdisciplinary performance. Uh, and the, the project we're doing is called Lucy AI, which is in collaboration with uh, our friend David Usher. Um, the sort of quick background is that um, in 2018, Lucy, who's one of the founding members of Blue Mouth Inc., was uh, <clears throat> diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer, and uh, that news um, was really impacted our community of friends. Uh, and Lucy and David and myself all went to university together, Simon Fraser, uh, back three decades ago. Uh, and when David found out the news, he started, he has a... Um, had a music career that sort of segued into doing artificial intelligence. Uh, and he was interested in how we could use AI as a way to poetically represent the career and life of his friend. Uh, so he initiated the project about a year ago, maybe two years ago he started talking about it, and then about a year ago we uh, really got into working on it. And Right now there's a team of people working together on our end. I'm working with a programmer in Isadora, uh, working with uh, triggering video content that is sort of the memory of Lucy. Uh, and then Lucy is doing writing and voice recordings, uh, and on David's end his team is uh, uh, developing through Unity um, a graphic and the voice of the AI, and then also in the cloud, uh, Jonathan is developing the actual AI. Uh, and trying to get all those things communicating in one space, um, you can come down and see me pulling my hair out later today, uh, trying to get it all to figure out, uh, all the IP and all the API and all the other stuff that I didn't know about six months ago. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. So the stage right now, I guess, is beta. Uh, this is the first time that we're actually 
getting all of the pieces to communicate all the various software and all the different, but the basic experience is that you, uh, you talk to a graphic representation, an abstract graphic that was made a touch designer, uh, that responds to Lucy's voice and modulates to Lucy's voice. Um, and uh, as you speak to it, uh, she thinks about it, returns, and then the, things, the, the conversation you're having with the AI, depending on what you're saying, triggers video content that's tagged. Uh, and it's video content from the last 20 years of Lucy's career or Lucy's life. So your conversation and other things as well. But it's basically the, the concept or the notion is uh, what would it be like to look into someone's memory and also to archive someone's life. What, what it, or I'm sure we'll get into the conversation like what is a life or what is real, what is not real. There's all these, like there's one really uh, significant point where we're like, does the AI know it's an AI? And so, um, or are we trying to recreate Lucy, which I don't think we're trying to recreate Lucy. Um, and there was some debate about whether it should be. I thought it should not know it's an AI. That's more dramatically interesting, I think. Uh, but the collaborators, so at the moment it does know that it's an AI. Uh, but it speaks with her voice. She's done like three hours of recording. It, she's answered 800 questions, so it uses her mind. And so it's quite, uh, I found myself the other day sitting in our apartment testing it. And I was talking to her for like 45 minutes and Lucy's sitting in the other room. Uh, Lucy's actually fine, just sorry, I should preface that, that uh, Lucy is healthy and she's stable, so it's great. And she's involved in the project, you can see her if you come by. Uh, but yeah, sitting in a room talking to this AI when my wife, Lucy, is actually sitting in the other room <clears throat> uh, is surreal. Thanks. I should mention, um, Lucy and, and David can't be here today, uh, but that's because they're on CBC Radio at 3.15 talking about the project. So we will play a video from David just talking about his work as a, a developer at, uh, partway through. Hi. Yes. Um, so yes, I, let's see, 2019, I was, I found myself in a situation, it's a long, complicated story, where I was suddenly the director for this BMO lab for creative research in the arts, performance, and emerging technologies and artificial intelligence. It took me a long time to be able to say that all in one breath. Uh, which, uh, when, when I was first approached with the idea that this was something that was coming about without any sense that I was particularly related to it, I thought, this is never going to happen. Okay, because it's an AI research center in a drama, theater, performance uh, program. I thought, they're not going to get, they were looking for money private money for this. I'm like, Who's like, what? I learned not to doubt the collaborators I was working with who found ways to take my natural skepticism and flip it, uh, flip it upside down. So now I'm open for anything, I think. <laughs> anyway, so the, the, the focus of the lab is as a center um, with grounded in a space of performance of real humans, of embodied awareness, of people who've been trained in voice and expression and meaning making and storytelling and movement uh, and to look at artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies through that lens. So to use the technology, say, okay, what are the possibilities for this technology for performance, but also what do these remarkable people have to tell us about their experience working with these systems? Because I think, you know, we're moving into a time when there's going to be more and more of this stuff Nothing against computer scientists and AI researchers, but they don't have all the answers or and certainly don't have all the questions that need to be asked. And I find that the kinds of questions we get to ask in the lab are really rich and a wonderfully different way to look both at you know performance related possibilities, but also what the hell is this thing and how how what are our relationships to it and what they should be. So we do a lot of development uh, work on actual AI systems, but uh, we, we're focused on doing AI systems that can work in real time so that you can really perform with them, you can dialogue with them, or you can, you know, that's a, a real focus because I don't think you really, um, especially people coming from the arts, shall we say, it's harder for them to, to, un to get an intuitive sense of what's going on and to find where the questions should be if it's this sort of more, okay, I'm going to type something in and half an hour later I'm going to get something back. So the real responsive thing allows us to engage all the things we already know in our attempt to understand what's going on with this and to shape and to ask really great questions. My favorite development ideas come from performers who are in lab going, but can't we, uh, okay, that's another six months of <laughs> work, but yes, we should be able to. So that's what the lab is and uh, we'll be talking more about it. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the show later, so I, I don't want to overlap with what I'm going to say, but in, I work with a company called Guilty by Association, um, and one of my collaborators is Patrick Blankarn, and the other is Sam Ferguson. Uh, in 2019, just to tie back to 2019, uh, we did another show called... Uh, uh, 1991. It's going to be a lot of years. Um, and that was an overhead projection show that we turned into um, kind of a live movie about my relationship when I was young with my dad. Um, so it was about border crossing, going from Canada to America, and uh, uh, traveling through VFWs, which are veteran foreign wars bars. Um, in 2021, my dad got diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. Um, so there's some overlaps with the Lucy AI. And I, during one moment when my dad was missing, uh, because he was delirious with COVID and had been released from the hospital and also was delirious probably from cancer. Um, he went missing for 72 hours on a road trip <laughs> and we couldn't find him. It's, 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 it, he's fun, so he called, and, but he didn't know where he was. He kind of, it was, it was both scary and fun, very scary, but also fun because my dad's hilarious. They found him crashed at a VFW, <laughs> no joke. And when that happened and the police called me, I texted Patrick and said, this is probably our next show, 20. 21. And, and so Patrick, uh, last year we decided to apply for Greenhouse Festival at um, Tarragon Theatre um, and we were very lucky to be accepted into the festival and decided to develop 2021. I should also mention that Clelia Scala was part of 1991, uh, who's sitting here in the audience and helped early develop puppets there for us um, and, and Puppeteer as well. Um, so 2021 initially we thought would be a live cinema piece with 3D model figures and archival material. Um, and in the middle of it, and I'll go into this a little bit more, I was asked to speak at a, a symposium called Machine as Medium at Yale's Collaborative Center for Arts and Media. Um, and uh, when I went, they asked me if I could connect our project to AI, and I was like, uh, or Alan Turing. I was like, um, there's no connection <laughs> whatsoever. But I thought about it, and I started thinking about it, and um, thought about things my dad had said, what we were doing with the archival material, and we started to make connections. Um, and a big part of what our project is, is um, how do you, most of that 2021 because of COVID was my relationship to being the primary caregiver for my father was mediated through technology. So I would talk to the doctors on FaceTime. Everything was through technology. I would talk to my dad because crossing the border was virtually impossible. And I had to save it for the moment he was dying. And I knew that. So uh, with that, that gave us an in towards technology. And even though AI is a, a part of our show, a bigger part of it is a video game. And that meant we had to target the AI very specifically. So currently I'll show you, a, you know, you'll see a little bit about how it works in relationship to my dad and their archival material, but it will also work for non-player characters. Um, and we even developed a, a heartbeat game that's a, through AI that is meant to keep a rhythm. And if you keep the rhythm, you help keep a character alive. Um, so it's used in function in many different ways that I don't talk about in the presentation in our show. Um, but the, I guess the kind of seed of what our show about is how do you care for someone and provide dignity and death when you fundamentally disagree with their politics. And then the other question that emerged through the process of starting to create it, I would say we're still very much in a beta phase as well, uh, even though we've done a few workshop presentations. Um, there, the, the other part is, what are the ethics of our data? What do we do with data? And what's, what, what do we do with it after we die or someone dies? What is the kind of ethics around how to handle and hold space for that data? So that's, a, that's kind of what we're working on. Sars. Sars. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for those introductions. Um, you know, I think, like, I, I wonder if I'm a performance maker and I'm like, oh, I want to make, make something with AI, I, I feel like I would be like, oh, I wouldn't know how to start. And so I'm wondering if, if you could each, if we just go around and just like actually talk really practically about like creative process and like how you approached it. David, I was wondering, oh gosh, I don't know, the, whatever the Arturo Ui thing was, I feel like I, I am genuinely curious about like how, what the training of that was like. Maybe we'll yeah. start with you. So I'll give you a little background for this. We did a performance during COVID. Uh, at Canadian stage um, of Brecht's uh, The Resistible Rise of um, Arturo Ui. And uh, one of the things that 
what we decided we wanted to do because in the in the play there's a first scene which is an introduction by a character that kind of tells the whole story in in kind of in verse and whatever and we thought wait okay there was a, the director wanted this to be quite flashy snappy showbiz and we realized that the easy, there were going to be a lot of cues and it would be interesting to see if we can have the actor control all the cues so we uh, we're working with motion capture suits, not uh, not the Vicon types that have the cameras, but just ones with built-in sensors that give you um, give you a, a good sense of, of movement without with, but being but but where you can perform on stage, mostly hidden by a costume with changing lights, etc., without that being a problem. And we were you know you can do very simple things where you can say just mathematically, okay, how close is the math of this pose to the trigger pose we want for this light? The problem with that is it's extremely hard to exactly repeat things like that first, uh, in the best of cases. Second, on opening night, you're really hyped. All your, all your movements are different, right? And, and, and when you're tied in a rehearsal, they're different again. And so, so the, getting something that was robust and reliable was, was just, I mean, we knew it was impossible. We tried it and it was like. So uh, it occurred to us that we could use AI and train an AI on a data set of all the rehearsals. So the performer, Sebastian Hines, wore the, the motion capture suit uh, for every rehearsal. We recorded every rehearsal. We went through and we indicated where we wanted the cues. And there were many, many sound lighting and video cues. And he choreographed freely around that to the point where we had a complete performance of about eight minutes, I would say where every lighting, sound, and video cue was controlled by him. And if you think about it, the body, you know, the body is this wonderful key we can use to unlock things because we have so many dimensions of freedom. So simply, you know, he could, for example, go to a pose he knew was going to be a trigger and then turn his head and boom, that light went on, right? So we could make it not just that he was cueing things, but he was cueing things in ways that made sense, but that also as a performer, he had confidence would trigger. And the key there was that the AI learned precisely over by looking at this data where he was consistent and where he wasn't. For this pose, forget about his ankle. He does all this weird stuff with his ankle in this pose, but the arm shoots out in a way that's very predictable. It meant that we could come up with a, the kind of perfect set of, of looseness and tightness to allow him to, to do that. So that was what we did for, for, with AI for that program. And what's interesting is that is a super simple AI. Uh, we're all focused on ChatGPT and DALI and all these massive systems. This was a tiny system that took, you know, 15 minutes to train once we had all the data together, but performed a really useful and powerful function. So we have to remember not to be distracted by the super shiny toys that OpenAI and Google are giving us. There's a lot of massively important and valuable potential if we have an idea, if we have a sense of that this would be something really useful. Thanks. Um, Cole, I, I haven't seen your presentation, so I don't want you to repeat yourself, but if you could talk whatever you can about just like, Ooh, yeah. how, how do I make a thing? Yeah. Um, so I'm known for being really terrible with technology. <laughs> um, sometimes I can't even find the emails um, wherever they are. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, how did it, we, we started by researching, so Discord, um, YouTube. Uh, we also had a very small budget. We had, um, so Patrick can code in C Sharp and Sam can code in C++, but neither, none of us are computer scientists. I'm definitely not. Um, and uh, we, our budget was very tight and small that needed to be for equipment. So we looked for what was free, what was available, and um, I, I began just doing really dumb things for fun with ChatGPT or like Google Gemini, but mostly being a jerk to it, to be honest, because I don't like that it tries to humanize. It makes us want to be polite, I find, and treat it like it's a person, and it, it's, it's something different. So I'm curious about uh, what I didn't know at the time. It's called hallucinating, so I would try to make it hallucinate all the time, um, at, like when Gemini wouldn't allow you to do... Uh, depictions of humans. So I would try to recreate David Hockney paintings. This is why Marcel and I were talking about back there before. I would try to make David Hockney paintings using hairless cats. Um, and then you have to really play with the prompts in order to get it in different positions. So the, partly by just playing, I started to learn how to prompt. I think uh, it was that, that simple. Then what we did is we did use available kind of things that access 
ChatGPT, OpenAI, and Sam used plugins into MetaHumans, and we taught ourselves. I, I think that's real. It. I mean, I couldn't do what Sam did in relationship to Unreal Engine. And the next step is that we are incorporating some motion capture into it. Um, but the prompting, we're still learning. The, the knowledge bank, as the, because we didn't build it ourselves, and there's real value to that, instead we're fine-tuning what's available to us within our budget um, and abilities. The fine-tuning then needs to change. So to come here this week and do a demo, um, the software is upgraded. And once they change two things, it changes the whole character of our AI um, character. So then I had to go in and change the knowledge bank around and create the prompts. So I, I still think it's actually very rocky it's not what I where I want it to be at all um, and that will take probably like I was also talking with my father <laughs> and my daughter and my husband were nearby and then I made him too polite and my daughter said I liked him when he was crankier that's more like grandpa <laughs> so I went back and kind of adjusted his anger <laughs> yeah and 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 then prompted changed the prompts around his objectives and his goals so for me most of mine is around prompting and language base and not the coding and I find it as someone who's not technological, it's quite fun. It's like puzzle solving. And really, I would say I'm the person who like, can barely turn a computer on half the time. So it, it is accessible. And even to a point where now I think Sam and I are looking at trying to build our own small models. And that feels not too far out of range of something that's possible. Cool. Steven, I know um, in the video, David Usher talks a lot about the technical part of it. But I just wonder if you could speak about, about you know, like, what you and like Lucy do as artists to kind of think about this? <clears throat> well, there's actually like a whole bunch of things to unpack. I feel like both everyone was saying, but I would say first thing came. We're thinking of the. I work in a collective, which is its own beast. So uh, uh, working collaboratively and collectively uh, has a whole set of parameters in terms of knowledge and and, and who gets to do what and. and uh, delineation of, uh, of chores. Um, but one thing I was just thinking of when I came, I came to Folda seven years ago, I think. I don't know if it was like the first one. Uh, and um, uh, I was doing, we were doing some research. Uh, first to say, I think what motivates Blue Mouth or maybe just motivates me as an artist is just a basic curiosity. And I think a curiosity in technology, a curiosity in creativity, and so just general uh, curiosity. Uh, and when we, I came to Folda, um, we were working on, uh, we were collaborating with an app designer, which we thought at the time that we were going to do VR, uh, but we had no idea what we were talking about. And so, but what, the thing that struck me when I came, uh, and mainly myself, is just this lack of general literacy that everyone was calling VR, AR, mixed reality, uh, you know, it was like, it was all over the place. And I felt the only person at that time, and this is a criticism of myself, there was somebody here from the Banff Center who was like, you guys have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, and was thinking about like things like ethics. And I was like, we don't, even, we don't even know, we don't even have the words yet to sort of talk about, you know, what we were ended up doing uh, with that particular project is also we're a bit of aesthetic snobs. So uh, it couldn't, what we could afford didn't look interesting to us. So what we ended up doing is working with a, a coder and developing a phone app and working with 360 video that was put into Google Cardboard and did like a trip to Sarajevo. Uh, and with, at the time, it just seemed to like we didn't have the, the resources to make a VR uh, and the augmented reality just was not interesting to us and mixed reality was still in development. So, so there's a practical part of it. Uh, there's a financial part of it, uh, just being like what, when we were working on the app, we didn't have the resources to hire somebody who could really do the job, and so or what we envisioned. And um, but now working with David, uh, he's got a team of people, and it's research for his company, and it's advantageous for his group to do all this research, and it's also just interesting creatively to him. But we had to pay his 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 staff to do all the work that they're doing, or even pay ourselves for all the work that we're doing. Uh, the budget would be ridiculous, and you know we have a small Canada Council grant that we've been milking for two years. Uh, so there's that aspect of it. And there's one thing just to bring up, just to, there's another aspect of it, which I think is generational, that uh, part of this, Lucy AI is part of a bigger project that's um, connected to an immersive performance called uh, Elephant that we were developing during the pandemic. I feel like all these works were, I went to a thing the other day where everyone started at the same time. It's all post-pandemic work that we're all doing now. Um, so we started working on Elephant and uh, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, 
Oh, generational, thank you. Yep, there you go. <laughs> That's, that's a, there's an example of that. So one of the creative process, somebody in the group said, hey, let's do a show, because we were all in three different cities, and we were creating something online during the pandemic. So we're like one of our collaborators, who is uh, 30, so around 30-ish, uh, and maybe half of the seven collaborators were not 30-ish, were like plus 50. And so um, she's like, let's do a show in, um, what do you call it? Uh, um, well, that, that video, immersive video game, like, uh, Fortnite. not Fortnite, was the other one? The real, the real Minecraft? Minecraft, sorry, there you go, here you go. So she's like, let's do a show on Minecraft. And we're like, sure, let's try it. So she did all this work on it and made all these little avatars. We got into Minecraft together and we did it for like a week because, you know, in a collective, you got to carry it forward. You know, you can't just shit, poo poo on things. So, um, but it was so evident who was not 30 and who was, who was 30 <laughs> years old because those of us who were like plus, and I was, curious and really giving it energy but there was definitely some people in the group who were just like walking it like going in their avatar in a circle and not building anything and kind of and to me aesthetically uh it didn't look very interesting fortnite seemed way more cool than than uh uh and but to the 30 year olds it was like that was the, the novelty of it that it looked really like like pong and i'm like yeah that looks like video from when i was in, uh, like a kid <laughs> Uh, but that was like, that was like the, the, the draw for her. Uh, so we did it for a week. We tried for five days playing in Minecraft. Uh, and then at the end of it, we're like, yeah, we're not going to do a show in Minecraft. Like, also, we're just interested in live. Even when we, with this show, we did an online version of Elephant. And then the idea was to come together after the pandemic, which we did, and do a streaming performance. Um, and we had, you know, the, we'd learned how to use all the wireless remotes and how to, you know, use a... And, but when we got together in a room, we realized we weren't interested in streaming. We were actually interested in being in the same space together. So then we had to pivot the piece to be more of an immersive uh, performance about people. what brings people together, like what brings us together. Uh, and Lucy AI sort of came out of that. So the idea with, um, is to sort of present them is where Lucy AI would be an installation that you could visit and talk to it and get insight. Uh, but it's about like holding on where the other one was about kind of letting go about a group of people about what brings us together and how we let go of things so anyway i guess it money generation and curiosity those are the things yeah. cool thanks i feel like i do need to note that we did have a show that was in minecraft at fulda four years ago called mine theater replacement really really cool show the way they made it interesting is it was about um, mothers relationships to their children when they lose them into minecraft so it's, you got to find a way in these things, I guess. Um, so uh, I kind of, one of the things that we've been doing at Fuller, we had another workshop this morning about AI and bias. And so um, I'm curious um, if either of you guys have any thoughts in particular about, um, you know, the way that these LLMs build in assumptions and, you know, they're trained on reality. Reality exists in white supremacy and many other bad things in our society. And so that, those things then kind of come into what the data is trained on. Um, do you struggle with that? Have any thoughts on that? Either of you. Um, there are, like, at least in, we're using Convey, which um, has some, uh, for its LLM, has some really strong, um, like, sensors on it that are um, hard to override. Um, and the, like, so yeah, this is something we talk about a lot. Like, one, it's, it's hard then to make a character, um, my dad was a difficult person. And so it's, it makes him nicer. And so there's also, ch there's challenges within that as well. It, um, other kind of like uh, biases are around how people speak. So he, the, the, there's clear grammar, and I, I was able to break it on the last one. This version, that was, since the updates, I haven't been able to break that yet. Um, but, so I, I'm still playing with that. So the, the bias also on what, like how language is constructed, how to put thoughts together, speak in metaphors. So it, 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 I, I find even that quite challenging. Separately, Patrick, Sam, and I, through Night Swimming, are doing a peer research project where we're, we were uh, exploring Unreal Engine, but it's slowly shifted towards coding. I was just talking to Marcel about that. And this is a little bit different than AI bias, but uh, coding, if you look at the logic of coding, you can apply that to text analysis and expose people's biases <laughs> in the room. And I find that has opened up a whole new world for me in, uh, in looking at biases too. I, I'm not an expert other than the prompting, on, uh, and you have to be aware of your own privilege and positionality in order to try to break 
that that and I yeah I don't think we're knowledgeable enough, but it's pretty it's pretty embedded and I think dangerous in some some ways depending on how that AI is being used, what for, yeah. Yeah, I think that the interesting problem uh, that you see a lot in computer science, I mean, there's a lot of really, really hardworking AI researchers who are really concerned about bias, which is great. And a lot of them are trying to engineer the bias out. And that's because that's an engineer's approach. We can solve this, right? And the problem is that that tries to make disappear the structural biases in culture that even if you get a perfect representation in your data set of actually how things are happening, the biases of the culture that are producing that data are going to, the, the, the AI is going to perfectly, like beautifully, beautifully, but you know, like new, be, come up with a beautifully nuanced representation of that bias. And so really the way to solve AI bias is to fix society. <laughs> And many of the ways that you might try to engineer bias out are just hiding the bias that's still going to be there. And that's a problem. Uh, on the other hand, I very much agree. I can't talk to ChatGPT. It's like, partly it's because it's mansplaining as a service, right? It's like, <laughs> I kind of know what it's talking about. And ultimately, the answer is, blah, you know, whatever. Um, and not everyone knows, but what's happening there is actually that, that each of those commercial level chatbots that you can talk to online reads themselves a script before they talk to you. Every single time, it reads a script, which is kind of like a character sketch description. It says, you know, it says stupid things like, you know, you will be a helpful AI assistant. You won't say nasty things about non-public figures. You won't do this, you won't do that. So, and, and if it doesn't read, so and uh, there's a famous example a while ago of the, the I think it was a New Yorker journalist who uh, who spent all night talking talking to Bing Chat, and at the end Bing Chat was saying, "Your wife doesn't love you. I love you. Leave your wife for me." Right? And so so what was happening there was that this helpful suggestion, "You will be a helpful AI," it had kind of disappeared out of the history of the chat, right? Because every chatbot, every a large language model has a context, the amount of stuff it's looking back at to determine what it's going to do next. And you know, for a long period of time, that you're going to be a helpful AI is sitting in there as part of those instructions. But then he was at it for seven hours, and it just sort of disappeared. And suddenly, the thing went haywire. <laughs> now, that's scary, and it's exciting. Because frankly, uh, so I've been working a lot in the lab with chatbots where either they don't have this kind of guidance prompt, or you can make your own. So you can say, no, 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 you are a chimney sweep in Victorian England who has relationship problems and is really hungry. And it will answer every question you have approximately, somewhat stereotypically within that vein. Or you can just say, you know, no holds barred, and it will go kind of anywhere that the dregs of the internet might have led it to go to. Because we have to remember these models were trained. They're not just trained on a, on a, on, on a society with its complex challenges. They're trained on what's most scrapable about our society, which is the internet. And that means every chat, like sort of dungeon of dark, dark conversations about things, um, is in there. So, so it, will, it will very happily go to strange and complicated places. The other thing that I think that's really useful is not so much about bias, but it's about truth. And it's important to understand, unlike computers historically, going back pre-deep learning, where they just, it's just following rules, and if you, know, you put the right data in, you get the right answer out, there's nothing like that in deep learning systems. They're trained by looking at a lot of examples. They learn patterns from those examples. What they learn is not what's true, but what probably has been said, what's probably been said somewhere, which has very little to do with truth. And when we think about it as creators, well, we tell stories. We make up stuff. We make up stuff, maybe trying to get to the truth, and we make it up. So there's a, you know, human culture is a culture of fantasizing, in a sense, on, on, on many ways. And these large language models model that. And the scary thing is there's another kind of bias, the sort of the, the not real bias, where you make everything very polite and whatever. I love the shit that comes out of Llama 3 when you just because it's making stuff up in a, with, a, with a crazy kind of freedom. It's not the same. It doesn't have intent. It doesn't have 
things that we have that, that drive our storytelling, but it is really good at coming up with coherent and very unexpected stories. So from an artistic perspective, I wouldn't want that to be canceled out. We don't want middle of the road, you know, straight jacketed uh, intelligence while acknowledging absolutely the dangers of disinformation. So absolutely, I and mean, we have got ourselves into an interesting pickle because on one side we need the create, creative energy that things, you know, I mean, we need it to have the creative energy it can have if it's gonna be around us, we want that, but we also don't want it to be you know, messing us up politically, so that's a lot. But. I have a question for you folks who have more experience than me. I had a, um, a uh, fourth year undergrad student who did her final project with me this year named Dominique Delben. And Dominique's project was, can I write a play with AI? And I think we agreed that the answer was no at the end of the semester. Um, and what we kind of drilled down to is that um, we couldn't, you know, Dominique was just using free tools like ChatGPT, et cetera. But what she found was she could not get the LLM to generate subtext. And so, you know, the best we could do is like a children's story where there is like no kind of psychological element to it. And I'm just wondering if, if any of you guys have any thoughts on, on these LLMs and, and like the subtext question. It's really, it's really a complicated question, partly because subtext is implicitly kind of not in the text, but inferred from the text. And LLMs work very much from the text. Mm -hmm. um, and so much of our relationship to LLMs is complicated by the fact that we will see subtext even where it's not there, because we're meaning, so we're searching all the time for meaning, for sense in whatever we're reading. And so, so um, when we do get a glimmer of subtext, it's usually our own brains doing all the work of inventing a kind of uh, uh, conspiracy theory like, oh, I found a subtext, right? Because um, we, we will do that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't categorically say that I think it's impossible for it to produce subtext. Um, and part of, the, part of the reason is, I mean, it's the same thing, like can uh, an LLM become conscious? I don't really think so, but I sure know it can talk about the quandaries of being conscious because it's read vast num amounts of human literature where there has been questioning of like, what does it mean to be a person and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's very hard to parse out the difference between stuff that, that appears in the text, uh, which is so often just a function of the fact that, it, yeah, it's, it's been fed entirely on people, you know, telling stories and questioning and wondering. That's interesting. This has occurred to me, but uh, I'm biased because I, I trained as an actor many years ago at the Moscow Art Theater where uh, Chekhov's plays all went on for the first times. And, you know, often when we talk about that theater, we talk about like the uh, ad event of psychological realism as an acting style. And I, I think about psychological realism, that is kind of analogous to general in intelligence in some ways. Like it's a, realistically being a human uh, as an acting technique, but also like realistically being a human as an AI would probably be a self-aware AI. So maybe that's just where we have to get to replicate that. I don't know if that's a question or a thought. Um, so I'll move on. I, I, having talked to all three of you about your projects, I've noticed that the one thing that all three of you talk about is um, fine-tuning or tuning your projects. And I wonder, uh, is, is this a true statement that um, a large part of the creative process in an AI performance is tuning. Yeah, I mean, because we're using Lucy's brain or Lucy's, um, as far as I understand, uh, it, we're, for the most part, we're trying to make it a closed system. I mean, clearly there's a base knowledge that they're getting from ChatGPT4, like some sort of understanding, and uh, but we're trying to make it really about Lucy's experience and only Lucy's experience. And so, um, so Lucy answered lots of questions, so a lot of it's like trivial things, like, you know, where her parents are from, how many brothers and sisters she has, things like that. But then trying to get at the essence of who she is as a person is, uh, we've been, t again, tuning that in terms of like, you know, some obvious things like it's not, not asking enough questions, it's not sarcastic enough, it's too nice. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it, yeah, 
so it is a lot of going back and forth. There was a, the other day, I asked the AI a question. I was like, oh, who are the founders of the comp our company, Blue Mouth Inc.? Uh, just testing it, and there's four, and the, the thing right away said, oh, uh, Lucy, Stephen, Richard, and Claudia Moore. And <laughs> Claudia Moore is a choreographer from uh, Toronto. And I'm like, oh, no. So it got that information from somewhere, and then I corrected it, and I said, no, no. I was like, uh, founding members of Blue Mouth are Lucy, Stephen, Richard, and Sabrina Reeves. Uh, and uh, Lucy AI is like, oh, thank you. She's like, sorry about that. Thank you for correcting me. And so the next day, I went back to it, and I was like, I didn't remember. And so I'm like, oh, who are the founders of Blue Mouth Think? And it said Lucy, Richard, Stephen, and Sabrina Reeves. And I'm like, I was like, oh, my, it's learning. And I got like really excited. I'm like, oh my God, the thing is actually learning. Uh, and so then I texted David and I was like, oh, it's learning. It doesn't have to, we have to program all this stuff in. Uh, and he said, no, it's programming. So that there's a, the way he described it to me, which again, I think is really interesting, that we did a project prior to this that was looking at uh, a debate between Noam Chomsky and, um, uh, and uh, Michel Foucault, which is about like uh, human, um, human nature and talking, and, and Chomsky is very much about like this, we're born with this basic knowledge, like how do we understand as children like really complex language systems that he was, I think, arguing in one degree that we're born with this innate ability to understand stuff. Uh, and there's a, there is an interesting parallel somewhere in, in, in this AI world. Um, but, but yeah, so David explained to me that uh, uh, there's the short term, there's, so there's the long term, the deep learning that they program in. Uh, but then every uh, you know three days, there's this sort of short-term memory that gets stored in the memory bank of the AI, and then they have to clear the cache, and then it goes away. So then five days later, I asked it again, and it got it wrong. And so then we had to, and uh, Sabrina, who's David's wife, is coming to see the show, and we'll definitely ask that question. So uh, we have to get that right. Uh, so like, okay, I mean, you got to type it in. So, so it's interesting about like knowledge and how where knowledge comes from and how we. Even now, we, we keep tweaking it because we, but then again, like we don't want to recreate Lucy's brain, that we're not interested in creating Lucy, uh, but uh, um, we're creating something else. So sort of short side thing. When we first started doing the project, we called it, uh, when we applied for a grant, we called it uh, Souvenir. So we thought that sounded very poetic and beautiful. Uh, we didn't get the grant when we applied. Uh, so uh, we reapplied and uh, uh, we were working on the grant and so, um, at some point, I'm just like, why are we making it one step more difficult for people to understand what we're trying to do? So I just call it what it is. So we'll just call it Lucy AI. Um, and it was I a mean, small little thing, but it was really useful uh, for us to then to be able to look at what we were doing. And so now we have this real clear distinction between when we're talking about Lucy, who's the real person, and we're talking about Lucy AI, who's this thing that we're, we're collaborating on creating together. So, and refining and trying to make it as close as possible to Lucy without replicating Lucy. That sounds weird. Do you have a... Yeah, so fine tuning is really just another layer of training on top of the training that has been done on the model. So ChatGPT has been trained, uh, all, of, all of the Lama has been trained, et cetera. And there are different various kinds of processes where you can fine tune those by supplying a very specific set of new data and it adjusts its internal state so that it's more likely to produce stuff that's like that new data. Um, and we do a lot of fine tuning in the lab. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to show today is all about a, a, a particular fine tuning. One of the things that I found really interesting, because when you're talking about short-term memory, that was what I was calling context. Mm -hmm. So it's the history of the chat that you've been having and, and it's uh, they're, they're trying to make it longer and longer and longer. You know, it used to be 500 and you know, like 500 words. Uh, or used to, and, well, back in the day, it was three words. <laughs> uh, 500 words. You know, ChatGPT is maybe 32,000 words in its first version, and they're looking at a million words now. So, how much of that history can you hold on to? But that is ephemeral. There are systems. There are there's experiments with systems that do continuous learning. So they they are actually incorporating that new information into themselves. There are big problems with that because they can get corrupted. <laughs> and one of the, most, the best examples of that is actually that ChatGPT is always in danger of getting worse because more and more of the, of the internet that source, as a source of its data is produced by AI. 
and so it's feeding back on its own nonsense and it's it's flattening. So there's a real problem. There's like prime data, prime human data from 2021 that hasn't been completely polluted with AI, which is better for training on than what's on the internet right now. So so continual learning is a little dangerous because it can go awry. So right now most systems have this have this buffer of recent stuff, which is non-permanent. Very fun to play with though, because you can just say, can you can you rephrase that? Yeah, but but with a Shakespearean sort of you know whatever. Um, but uh, fine tuning is also playing with this interesting space between the kind of collective pseudo universality of these large language models that have been supposedly trained on everything and a voice, which is defined by what it doesn't, as much by what it doesn't care about, doesn't know, didn't experience as what it did. And so how, how you position the notion of subjectivity and individual and identity within the frame of an AI that is kind of a blurring of, make, to make all of those things disappear in a way in its grandest sense is I think a really interesting area to, to think about from the perspective of, of us artists who care about subjectivity profoundly and an individual voice. Why do we love this particular artist of whatever form? It's not because they have everything, it's because they have a very specific set of things. And uh, we found a problem of training large AIs, fine tuning convincingly on a single person's body of work because it knows too much. The, the AI has to be small enough to not just, just be able to off. absorb, absorb that into this large pool of things. So what I'll show you is an older AI which is the right size for holding on to one person's creative output, for example. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Cole, in your presentation, are you going to talk about Alan Turing? Uh, very little. I would love to. I know. I just having read some of your articles and my own personal obsession, uh, I'd just love to know like how you're relating Turing to this work. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'll talk a, like very slightly about morphogenesis in the the, the presentation, so I'll hold off on that. Um, but uh, Alan Turing, uh, kind of the father of computers, or I don't you know, I don't know if that's a paternal. That's I'm not a historian or someone who knows. <laughs> Let's, uh, but uh, Alan Turing, I'm going to talk more about him uh, where where we. I, we found a way in. Um, when his uh, his best friend, when he was young, passed away, and he was uh, it was said to be that he was in love and that they that he loved this young man, Christopher. And Alan wrote Christopher's mother after he passed. And in one of the letters, he questioned um, the nature of spirit. And these are where some of these questions around can AI be sentient? Like, can, does it have? Uh, is it possible for AI or computers to be? Um, uh, like uh, have a consciousness um, the, and he asked in that letter he's, he uh, kind of thought what if our body is a mechanism like our spirit is like our body is just a machine that holds spirit and so after I die what if the spirit is just kind of floating around looking for another mechanism to hold on to and what if it can find a machine to hold on to then that machine could have spirit and so that was our way in, in a way, as my father was very much trying to find ways to hold on. Um, and so we were curious about, could we give him a machine? If he found a machine, would he want to hold on? Could he, do we want my dad to hold on? That's where probably questions about bias come in. Who gets to hold on? Who doesn't get to hold on? How do we make these choices around who does? That's less about Alan Turing and more about the work. But that was, we've uh, through the personal, because I'm not, uh, I'm not a, a specialist. <laughs> yeah, but a little bit about morphogenesis was my other one in looking at patterns. Cool, thanks. Um, so um, Cole and David have cool things they're going to show us after the break, but I wanted to make sure Blue Mouse had a cool thing too. So um, we just have a, a short video uh, where I interviewed David Usher, who is the founder of Reimagine AI, the company um, Stephen mentioned that's working with them. So uh, I think we should probably get out of these chairs or we're going to be in front of the TV. So Jesse's just going to play a short uh, video with David Usher, and then we'll take a quick break.
David Usher, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us via Zoom recording for uh, the Pull the Startup series. David Usher, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us via Zoom recording for uh, the Pull the Startup series. Uh, we've just talked to Stephen and Lucy, um, and so it's great to be able to talk to you a bit about your work. So, David, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and Reimagine AI. Uh, I mean, I started as an artist. Um, in theory, I still am. I mean, I, I was, uh, I've been a musician for, I, I guess, 35, 40 years. Um, like as a professional musician, uh, touring and traveling and playing. Um, and I got into artificial intelligence about uh, 10 years ago, I think. Um, the reason I got into it, I, I, I wrote a book on creativity and innovation. And I do a lot of speaking to a lot of technical te technology companies, but a lot of companies generally about tech, uh, about creativity and innovation. And about 10 years ago, um, I started to feel that artificial intelligence was the next big technology that was going to be disruptive. And I didn't feel that I could speak to these companies and institutions without, uh, without talking about AI. And I don't do anything in my talks that I don't understand firsthand. Like I don't want, want to be a talking head that's read it in a book and then speaks about it. Just yeah. regurgitates it. So, I did my first project uh, with Google Google Brain, um, doing an artificial intelligence agent that could collaborate with humans writing song lyrics, and that really sparked my interest. So I looked for you know where could I find a place for myself within this sort of ecosystem because I'm obviously not a computer scientist or a programmer um, or a data analyst. Um, so I really sort of found this place in the interface between AI and the human experience. Sort of, I have a lot of experience with, uh, with different kind of experiential, you know, how to get, how to, how to connect to people. And um, I sort of just threw myself into it. And from there, we built the company, which started about seven years ago. Cool. And so I noticed just before we get into Lucia, you also have like a healthcare wing to the company. What kind of work is that? Yeah, we do. We focus mostly on in um, enter, interactive entertainment and, um, and our other main focus is in the healthcare. So we have a couple of different applications um, that we're working on. One is around um, building virtual um, companions that can um, uh, work with the elderly and Alzheimer's patients to mitigate uh, loneliness and uh, increase engagement. Um, I sort of fell into this by accident because my mom has Alzheimer's and, you know, you really notice um, that, you know, healthcare workers and families can only be there so much. And there are still lots of hours in the day. Mm -hmm. And we're at a place now where, where virtual companions are a real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we were working on many other different verticals within health as well. So that's, that's one of the things. Cool. And so, um, so how, how did Lucy AI come about as a project? Um, well, I mean, Stephen and Lucy have probably talked about it, but um, I went to university at Simon Fraser with, uh, with Lucy and Stephen and um, I was doing a political science major and a dance minor. And Lucy, um, Lucy was in the dance department, also studying math. And um, I met mo both of them through through that. And Stephen was was teaching, so um, that's how we all became friends. And we've sort of been all fast friends forever. Uh, my wife was one of the Sabrina was uh, one of the original founding members of Blue Mouth. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've sort of stuck together through thick and thin through this whole process. And about seven years ago, when Lucy was diagnosed with cancer, um, you know, I was in the middle of, you know, building, you know, building artificial intelligence, virtual beings. Um, and this was at before the, 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 the sort of what I would call the modern, um, LLM revolution, large language model revolution. Um, but you know, I, I had this, I had the idea that it would be just a, just an amazing, interesting project I, to, to, to um, work with Lucy to rebuild her mind, yeah. and, you know, capture memories or thoughts and feelings and all of those kind of things. I didn't approach her, her about it for quite a while. Um, but when I finally did, she, you know, she totally embraced the idea as did Steven and has been sort of on this adventure. Uh, we've been on this adventure together. So, you know, I'm I'm going to assume looking into the future that um, Lucy and Stephen have talked a bit about the creative process behind Lucy AI. I'm wondering if you can speak a bit like about technically like what was required. 
Yeah, I mean, we have an API that integrates all kinds of different technology. It's pretty much a plug and play stack. So we're always pulling out the putting pulling out and putting in the latest and great greatest AI tech that's coming down the pipe because there's always new things coming in. So it's not only an AI stack, it's also an interactive stack. So it's connected to all sorts of different kinds of interactive technology, everything from, you know, motion detectors, uh, facial recognition, if, if we want to put it in, um, web applications, web apps, web microphones um, that can work on iPhone, Android, um, link to touch designer, all, all, all kinds of different programs that it's sort of, it's a web of tech. Mm -hmm. and we can use any part in any project. Wow, cool. I've seen some of the touch designer stuff. It's really wild. Um, so just to drill down like practically, like what is like what does that look like in a rehearsal process or like a creative process? Like where do they come and what you what do you do? Well, building the the mind with Lucy is basically just taking, you know, continually taking inputs from her. Yeah, you know, getting her to help build and construct her memories and thoughts and ideas about the world. And then um, for us, it's about, you know, continually trying to figure out how we can improve on the, the, the context or understanding of the language model to deal with those things. And then we also have a chat-based system. In, like we, our, our system is mic, a mix of chat and LLM. So it's a mix of these things. And we can control, um, we can control how we move between the two, the two models. Mm -hmm. um, so we're constantly tuning tuning it to make it more like Lucy. Um, you know, is it is it being too nice? Is it being too mean? Is it does it know enough? You know, and these things will be that these things will be con continually developed over time. We're at the very where you know this is a beta, so we're at the beta stage. Um, and then with with St with Stephen as well, it's been a lot about trying to figure out how to integrate all of the videos and images that reflect the ideas that Lucia is talking about while she's talking about them and how these, you know, programs work together and connecting Isadora with touch designer. Isadora is not something we used before. So Steven mm -hmm. is, you know, in Isadora and connecting the two and making sure they're talking back and forth and the handoffs and all of these kind of things. So it's been, a, it's been really, you know, it's been a fun uh, experience. For sure. That's great. A couple of years ago at Fulda, we had a, a five hour workshop on Isadora for beginners and mm -hmm. people came out of that like with their minds kind of mush. It's a tough, it's a tough one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask one other thing kind of not related to Lucy AI, but I was on um I was on a panel for a festival here last week uh, called Spring Reverb, uh, like Indie Rock Festival. And uh, it was an AI panel. Um, not sure if I it was the right expertise to be on that panel, but but I, I know beep boops, I guess. And I definitely noticed from the audience like some real skepticism about AI and like what it meant to the music industry. And like, you know, for obvious reasons I probably don't need to unpack. But I'm just curious like if you how you see the music industry and AI coming together and pitfalls and you know opportunities. Yeah, I mean if I, I follow I, I follow pretty much all AI tech that comes out and test every single every single program that comes out to see what it does, what can be useful, and what can. I I, I think that um, you know there's a lot of talk now that AI is overhyped. That's the newest the, sort of the newest thing. I don't I don't think it is. I I really think that the development curve is is continually rising. And you know if you looked at what music was doing five years ago, artificial intelligence and music five years ago. Um, it was doing, it was terrible. It was impossible. Um, and now, you know, you really can generate full songs. There's, a, there are, you know, one of the, one of these at Suno, I think, or, or Udio or something like that is doing stems where you can do, you can upload your stems and it will, it will add to your stems. So it's going to be this mix of, this mix of things. I talk a lot about one of, one of my big things is talking about AI pollution, where there's just going to be so much crap out there generated by AI that it's going to, it's going to really overwhelm us all. Mm -hmm. you know, one of those things in the social contract that's going to be, you know, if we thought we were overwhelmed and had a shortest tension span, tension span before, um, the amount of material we're about to have to sift through is going to go exponential. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a public intellectual in the States, I think his name is Jason Sadowski, and he has this idea of Habsburg AI, where 
because we train AIs on the internet, but AI creates all the new content for the internet that it's going to start kind of training on its own outputs. And then where, where are we then? That's a big, that, I mean, that's a big conversation that's going on right now is about synthetic data, mm-hmm. right? The big, the big uh, tech companies are running out of uh, real data because they've scraped the entire web and there's not enough being generated. Um, so there's a, they're, they're, what they're trying to do is create synthetic data. So AI trains on its own data. But the question is whether it will just become um, more and more degraded as you sort of, you know, you breed with yourself, as it were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hence the Habsburg analogy there. Um, David, thank you so much for your time. It's really great to have your voice and, and just kind of hear your contribution to this project and, you know, have you be here virtually for a full day. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye bye.
our time evenly here. So Cole's going to have about 25 minutes with you, and David will have about 25 minutes with you. Um, and I'll get out of the way. Um, so rather than start with a demo, I'm going to start with a slideshow uh, to give you context around the project and a better understanding of where AI fits in it, and then allow an opportunity to play uh, after if, there, uh, if there's desire to do so. Um, OK, what is it to hold on? How does one do this? When we die, must we let go? Or might there be another way to hold on? These are some of the questions that my dad had in 2021. I work with Guilty by Association, and GBA is an interdisciplinary framework that shifts its process with each new project or dramaturgical question. We conspire with kind of an ever-expanding network of collaborators uh, from far out disciplines and far away places to investigate what this little world of theater can offer the larger world we live in. We experiment with new technologies and merge them in, particularly things we maybe don't know anything about or uncomfortable with, and it can range from experimenting with the technology of paper uh, to um, robots to overhead projectors to AI or large language models. Uh, currently, it's led by myself and Patrick Blankern, who's a multimedia artist who co-created Asses Masses, which is uh, at Folda in the past, and uh, recently uh, was at FTI in Montreal. Um, also, Patrick was written about in this book, Play Dramaturgies of Participation, which they had a book launch here at Folda yesterday. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that great book. Um, we also often collaborate with sound designer, composer Sam Ferguson, who's a C++ coder, and built this awesome plugin called Delay Troll that all musicians and sound folk should check out. Um, 2021 is an expansion of our previous work, 1991, in which uh, digital voice modification, overhead projection, and shadow puppets are performed live. These technologies combine to construct a memory film projected above the performers. Um, I play myself, and uh, Jessica Carmichael played about 10 other characters live um, operating her voice modification. Um, and I ran sound. As a sequel, 2021, this rehearsal photo was taken by one of our co-projection designers, Alex gross Dondes. I'm saying her last name wrong, sorry, Alex, um, who is uh, uh, at Toronto Metropolitan University, um, and opens itself up to questions of spirit. What patterns do we inherit and revive from live performances now past? We did 1991, now we're doing 2021. Do we inherit anything from that? What does theater want to do with the ghosts? And why do we want to speak with them? What does theater try to hold on to and resurrect? What does theater let go? In the year 2021, I was a long distance caregiver for my homeless Trump supporting father, who's American. And he was passing away of pancreatic cancer. I did everything I could to help him, mostly from Canada because the borders were closed and it was a pandemic. At his request, I tried to help him hold on to his life, to his body, to his spirit. My dad often appeared in my work, uh, probably because we didn't get along for much of our lives, but also had a deep love for one another. And he encouraged me to film him, take photos and record his voice so I would always remember our time in 2021 together. He told me, you'll use it in a show one day. <laughs> I did not use this photo in a show, <laughs> but I did use those photos in the corner, which are of him when he was in Vietnam. Initially inspired by my work with a Singapore director, King Sung Ong, I thought we'd be exploring an archive of memories, like mining these documents about how my dad and his six siblings were abandoned by their parents in England and then shipped off by the England's colonial project to America to live with and be raised by a father who did not want them. We thought we'd build another live cinema performance. Our plan was to print 3D models and puppeteer their shadows amidst archival material for live feed cameras that would be edited live on stage, more akin to our analog 1991. But then I was invited to speak about my uh, process at a symposium in November 2023, and I had to let go of my old ideas. So at Yale's Center for Collaborative Arts and Media, their Machine and Medium Symposium, I was encouraged, as I mentioned earlier, to relate my ideas to Alan Turing, or at the very least, allow myself to be inspired by him. 
And I saw it as a challenge, <laughs> which I like. Um, I, I have a hard time saying no to challenges. <laughs> um, I began to research Turing's ideas. Um, and uh, this is a, a part, an example of the letter he wrote in 1932, grieving his first love. Um, his work on morphogenesis and patterns. And these are some of his drawings. Morphogenesis uh, really loosely means the generation of form and usually is used in the context of developmental biology, proved uh, mathematically true 60 years later because they didn't look at his research because he was queer. Um, it is largely considered a pattern of life. Imagine two chemicals washing over the skin. One changes the skin pigment, the other stops it. This creates patterns when they interact and spread, like stripes on a tiger versus uh, spots, if, they if the patterns crisscross, you get the spots on a leopard. And this impacts so many different biological aspects of us, including how cells change shape. Loosely inspired by the idea of mor morphogenesis, I began to wonder, in which ways do I repeat my dad? In which ways does he repeat me? What are the endless patterns of him, of me inside him, of him inside me? Where does my dad stop in me? Where do I begin? With help from Dr. Chris Alexander and the Red Bull Gaming Hub at TMU, I worked to reveal the patterns of father uh, in the patterns of me as daughter and the patterns of me as daughter in the patterns of father, just even on my face um, and his face. So I 3D scanned my face and morphed it with photos and measurements of my dad's face to reveal the patterns of both of us physically um, and build with uh, Sam Ferguson an avatar of my father in MetaHuman um, using MetaHuman Convey and a lip syncing uh, plugin uh, called AI Brian. We wondered, what if Turing was right? I, I'm, I'm not allowed to say in the show what I think, <laughs> but I have an opinion. Uh, what if a body is simply a mechanism that can attract and hold spirit? Can a spirit then, even if you believe in spirit, find another mechanism? another machine to hold on to. So to give you context of how the play works, because it's not just about the eye, 2021 begins with a 3D printer uh, printing a model of my dad. Uh, downstage are objects that belong or relate to my dad. This is from our workshop presentation. That's my dad's wallet, which I've only taken one envelope out of since he died. That's his Bronze Star Medal, which we discovered he won when uh, he died, and it was on his, his tombstone. We didn't know. He kept it a secret. Um, those are remote controls, because TV. Uh, that's a Father's Day card I made him, in which I ask for money. <laughs> um, that's his photo album from Vietnam, a VHS tape of my eighth birthday, and 1969, um, eight, oh gosh, what's it called? The eight, the film, early film. <laughs> yeah, super eight, thank you. Uh, I'm terrible with names, of uh, Vietnam footage from his time there. This is the first cell phone he bought me. Um, these are his documents from the Children's Aid Society. And then finally, um, this is a book called Performing Remains by Rebecca Schneider. In her book, she questions how some people worship theater's ephemerality. Who's heard theater's ephemeral before? Yes. So here she says, yeah, it's here, theater's here, and then poof, it's gone. It's amazing. That's what we love. It's liveness. No, she argues. Performance remains. It remains in our bodies and in the things. It's not ephemeral. Prompted by my time at Yale exploring Turing and my collaborator Patrick's interest in Schneider's idea, we decided after introducing the audience to some of my dad's material remains, we would, as in Rebecca Schneider's book, she talks about reenactments. So we decided, act two, let's do a reenactment. <laughs> and we decided to reenact my father's death. So, uh, we, this is how it works. A member of the audience is invited to play my dad. And by play, I mean literally. They come up on stage only if they want to and consent to, and they get to play a video game. And in the video game, they play a character of my dad navigating the hospital. Um, they can even choose to wear a costume or not. They can always say no. Um, this gentleman chose to wear a costume. <laughs> In playing the game, the player reenacts my dad's final weeks in the hospital while I live narrate the journey. The player is given a goal on each level, there's seven levels, and at this point, an object to pursue that will help them hold on. The audience, 
um, who freely offers advice to the player by yelling, go left, go back to the reception office, go there, and we'll eventually have more AI characters inside the video game that they can also talk to for more information about their goals, um, becomes, but by extension of doing that, the audience becomes a caregiver for the player and become my role of what I played for my dad. Um, and the role I took on in 2021 as I cared for him via mediated technology. Slowly, the player learns that their character, my dad, was to find a mechanism. The goal is to find a mechanism to hold his spirit. He's looking for a machine, something, anything to hold on, not just in fragments of him, an object here, a memory there, but the entirety of him. Um, sorry, it's not working. Oh, there. The story concludes with the appearance of a fully functioning 3D virtual AI version of my dad, trained on facts and documents about him that have been fed into a large language model, a mechanism to hold his spirit. I, improve a converse, I improvise a conversation with my AI dad based on input from the player. So the player is given an opportunity to, uh, if they could ask three questions of my dad, what would that, those three questions be? And then we introduce my dad. Um, and eventually my dad won't, uh, the AI dad won't be on a, a TV. He'll appear inside, it'll appear inside the video game. Um, at the very end, we question, after that conversation, we question the moral implications of letting a loved one live as a machine forever. And the play ends by giving the player one last final choice if they're willing to do so. They can choose to let go. I'll turn all the machines off. I will unplug the game. We will sit with the objects, the stories, and the memories of Brian that remain. It's my dad's name. Or hold on and leave the machines on. And then they can come and have conversations with the machine if they want to. So to conclude, what if a fully functioning AI version replicating someone is possible after death? What happens when there are more LLM death masks than there are humans? How do we communicate with and understand these LLM death masks? What kind of questions do we need to ask of them? 2021 asks, without judgment, what this might look like, what the ethics and the impact of this are, and whether we as individuals and as a community might want to live as machines forever, if that were even possible. It is necessary today to ask ourselves new questions about death, caregiving, and our data uh, death and caregiving for human data. And now I can sh switch over and we can show you kind of where uh, the AI Brian is right now um, and it's possible to ask some questions of him. So the software was updated recently for Convey, so we've started to rebuild the knowledge bank and play around a little bit. So this one's a little different than what we played with in January. How are you feeling today? Not good, of course, in these dark days. I think we want to take my name. I can't trust them. I'm not with you. How are you going to lie? Why would they want to take your leg? You know, everything's about money. It's all about money. Or something like that. That's more a personal thing, but it really bothers me. <laughs> I would prefer to call it it. <laughs> yeah. Oops. I'm not watching what I'm doing. There. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Um, so this is also it currently in uh, Unreal Engine, not yet put into our Unity video game. Yeah. So it's funny. It is really a question for you. Do you want to question? Sure. Would you? I don't know if that one. If that one. If the. How did, uh, how, how, 
Brian, how does it feel to be this particular age, Im Im immortal immortalized in this particular age? Or I guess, how old are you? Why does it matter how old I am? I've seen more than most will ever see. Age isn't the point. It's about what I've done and what I'm still fighting for. And don't you dare think I'm immortalized. My body's failing me, but my spirit, that's a different story. Do you wish, though, that you were a teenager? What's the point in wishing for something that can't be? Being a teenager was a different time with different battle. I can't go back and I wouldn't want to. I've got my daughter to think about now. She's my focus, not some dream of the past. So this is where I see some problems with the convey right now. He's very goal oriented on um, like fixing spirit, fixing. He's got a focus. He's got a charge. So he's not um, wandering as much as he used to in terms of making up memories. Or so those are that. That's where I'm going to be fixing <laughs> through prompts in the next little bit. He and he speaks in longer thoughts. There's no non sequiturs. These are challenges that I see. Like I don't like these responses. <laughs> in it, you want to ask more? Anyone else want to try? Don't be shy. Would you like to ask? <laughs> you don't have to. No, don't. I don't. I don't have one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, I'll just... Hi, Brian. Um, what's your favorite memory of you and your daughter? Oh, favorite memory, probably the time we went fishing, just me and Cole out on the lake. She caught her first fish, the smile on her face. I'll never forget it. Simple moments like that mean more than anything. So, uh, some things, I let my daughter ask him questions often. Um, we don't also, because we're because I, this isn't my specialty, I, didn't, I haven't tracked what we always ask him or done all the proper stuff you should as a researcher. Um, but uh, sometimes I just ask it very dumb questions, like, what do you like? Uh, oh, I'm in the right one. Did you get some McDonald's coffee today? McDonald's coffee. What kind of question is that? I'm stuck in this hospital, fighting for my so life. Coffee's the last thing on my mind. Focus on what's important, not trivial stuff like that. Yeah, in January, we, he was much more playful. He would, he would go explore outside the hospital. He'd sneak away from the nurses. He would have a lot more fun. Um, so that's something uh, with the adjustment. So Convey is built also to help build non-player characters in video games. So the idea of having an objective, having a pursuit, is very helpful to us. And we need it for the video game aspect. But it's limiting in terms of uh, what we were talking about earlier. I think that's probably... Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cole. That's a fascinating demonstration. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. We're just going to take one minute to plug David's uh, laptop in while Cole's laptops get unplugged.
And we're back. <clears throat> okay, so this is a different kind of older technology attempt to capture something about a person. And this is the current output of a project we're doing with, I'm probably moved out of the zone of the cameras. No, you, you, you can move the camera, okay. Um, with the uh, Canadian playwright Jason Sherman. So he came to us uh, eager to have all the plays that he's written um, put into an AI to see what happens. He's very curious about what AI might bring to playwriting, the process of playwriting, and so that's what we've done. But we've done it with an older version of, um, in the GPT family. So this is using something called GPT-2, which is sort of the grandfather of ChatGPT. Uh, it's a much smaller model. Um, this model came about in, a, I think, late 2018, 2019. Um, but uh, interestingly, we found that, and so we've, what we've done with Jason, we've trained this model on his material, and we've trained Llama, which is a very recent model on his, and he much prefers working with GPT-2 so far, because it's, for him, it feels truer to himself. And um, so I won't, go, I won't go deeper into that yet, because there's some fundamentals I want to show you before we get there. The first thing to remember about all these kinds of models is that they are next word predictors. Right? They're not omni-intelligent minds. They are next word predictors. They look at the context or the short-term memory of what's recent, what it's recently said and what has been said to it. <clears throat> and based on connections between and relationships between those words, and the statistics discovered from the fine-tuning on the particular material, in this case, Jason Sherman's plays, it makes guesses about what the next word should be. It doesn't, in fact, it doesn't really make guesses. It calculates the probabilities for every possible next thing, every, all of the 50,000 next things that could possibly come next, theoretically. It calculates a probability for. So if, and I've, I've just put the word tomorrow in, just for the hell of it, and I'm going to step forward, and we can see after tomorrow comma, we see what it's chosen, but we see also the probabilities laid out here. The further down in the list, the less probable, according to the statistics learned from so fine-tuning on Jason's work, the higher it is, the more probable, and the color gives you a sense of that probability. When a large language model actually chooses the next word, it's making a selection from the most probable things, but with a bit of randomness thrown in. So it's most likely going to choose the top thing, a little less likely to choose the next, and further down. Although it theoretically could choose down here, it's going to do that somewhat rarely. So uh, in this case, well, and you can see, okay, tomorrow, why, or tomorrow, mister, or tomorrow, honey. These are all plausible things to come next, and in fact, we can Take another step forward. Okay, tomorrow, why we? If we take a step backwards, whoops, backwards. Tomorrow, honey. No, tomorrow, I can go down. Tomorrow, Mark. <laughs> Let's see what happens. I'm just going to run it for a bit. Sorry. Have a seat. So, <laughs> it's been trained on Jason Sermon scripts. The, the, if you're not familiar with his work, there's a lot of interrupted discussion, a fair amount of profanity, uh, as we can see here. Um, and it does a pretty good job of replicating his interests and the choppy style of his discourse. I'm going to let it really run for a bit while I talk now. Whoops, wrong key. There we go. So it will just construct, and you can see it's writing a play. It's writing a play, not because I asked it to write a play, because that's all, but that's all it knows how to do now, having been trained on Jason Sherman's scripts. These systems are very good at, at discovering structure. Structure is the first thing they get. So yes, there's going to be a character name. There's going to be a, a discussion. I'm going to make it so that you can see more of the history, but not the probabilities, if I can get my mouse over here. There we go. So now you can see a little bit more of the history. I'm going to slow it down a bit so it's readable. Uh, something like that. 
But, but the, imp <laughs> the important thing about what's going on here is that although it's producing one text, it's actually calculating a whole field of possible texts all the time. So if we go back to where I was showing the, pro the possibilities, those possibilities, each of those possibilities leads in different directions. And so rather than being really a system for producing a script, it's a, producing, uh, it's a system for holding the, the field of possibilities of a Jason Sherman script. And of course, not really within the, the ma mathematical model of, of a Jason Sherman script. He, he plays with this and laughs hilariously. <laughs> It's a very strange kind of mirror to look in when you, when you, if you're doing something like this, looking at your own work, because it will go somewhere that's so familiar to you and then take a turn you did not expect, yet still that's within the statistical probabilities of how you've expressed yourself. What was interesting was when we trained Lama 3 on this, it would be quite Jason Sherman-like and then it would wander off uh, and, and sometimes get very problematic, you know, just very weird, like talking about things that he definitely would not talk about. In fact, things that were really alarming, like, um, not, like it even went to a neo-Nazi place once, which was very strange. <laughs> I mean, it can go there, and there are, there are probably reasons, because he's Jewish and he's talking about relationships to Palestine and things like that in his work, in some of his work, it's... The, and you add the dark belly of the internet into there and it will go there. What, what it, one of the ways to think, think about this is that a large model like Llama is too large, as I, as I mentioned before, to hold the subjectivity of a particular creator. Um, similarly, when you're training a model, uh, you want to make sure that the model's not too big for the data that you have. Large language models like ChatGPT are trained on the whole internet. The output of Jason Sherman is vanishingly small compared to the whole internet, and a model that's perfect for containing the whole internet is not the model that's perfect for containing Jason Sherman. What's he talking about now? Expo, all right. Um, okay, I'm gonna pause it for a second. So, um, okay, so one of the things we can do, let's just go, let's just play a game here with this. Um, I'm just, App? Oh, please do. Yes. So the model has Jason Sherman's writing plus the whole internet, or I thought it was just his writing? So it's not just his writing. It's his writing uh, as a fine tuning on top of what GP2, GPT-2 oh. knew of the internet, which is much smaller amount than what GPT, uh, chat GPT, GPT-4 knows about the, has of the internet. What that means, um, let's say a good way to put this is if, if you have a large model and you give it a small amount of data, even though it's not the only way it learns, the easiest thing for it to do with a small amount of data is just memorize it. It doesn't memorize it in the sense of just copying the file. It changes its weights and biases so that it can reproduce it. So it's not quite like copying in the familiar way. But so a large model, ah, I could just copy this. You have to, you have to have the model small enough so that, the, so that holding the body of a person's work in there is forced to generalize to hold it all, right? So you're trying to take a lot of work and hold it in a smaller space. It's an act of compression. You know, we, we deal with compression all the time when we think about it as JPEGs or whatever, but really compression, language is compression, right? We take experience, we compress it into language. I compress my experience into language, I hand it to you, you decompress it in your head. We're always compressing and decompressing. A language model is also taking this vast body, like for, in, for example, the internet, compressing it into something much smaller than the internet, but which does a reasonable job of reconstructing in the right conditions that. So you, but you, in, in fact, you want some compression, or what we would call in graphics, lossy compression because otherwise it will just copy. And we don't want to copy, we want it to generalize. Right? So any good AI is not copying, it's forced to generalize. And so you actually have to create impediments for it to, to generalize. So what happens is because this model is not capable of holding all the internet plus all this hardcore fine tuning on Jason Sherman stuff, the internet kind of, that information fades away. It's not completely gone, it will still appear occasionally. We can actually maybe see a little bit of it appear. Um, but 
it's capable of holding it in a way that was satisfying to Jason, whereas talking to the much more capable, fluent Lama 3 model, and faster, actually, um, was not satisfying to him. So I'm going to talk about one parameter of this model that's really interesting and that's, that's relevant, and we'll lead back to what I was talking about there, which is uh, something called temperature. So if we go back to this, where I'm showing the probabilities. Whoops, I've got to encourage it. There we go. OK, we can see now, in some cases, there's only really one option. After shut, apparently in Jason Sherman plays, no one shuts the door. Everyone just shuts up, because there's apparently no other option after a shut but up. And we're really, wow, I wonder if it's just, it, that's, this is memorized now, basically. The fact that there's only one option, this is probably a word for word output, which is interesting. Okay, now we're starting to get some. Probably, probably. Um, so to get around this, I'm going to raise the temperature. Now what, and we'll see what that does. Lots more options. Okay, what's really happened, these are still, in order of most probable to least probable. It's still the same kind of information, but now we've made the less probable ones more probable. Not as probable, but we've leveled the playing field so that the less probable ones are still somewhat likely to be chosen. So that immediately makes it so that it breaks quite easily out of anything. I mean, it's choosing, you can see it's choosing, I don't know, it's choosing something way down the list, because usually you will see in fact, it's choosing strange characters and things like that. Let's just run this at a high temperature for a bit. Oops. So high temperature, the way I like to think about high temperature is it's kind of like frustration, madness, and anger all mixed up together, right? If we're cool and collected, a little bit logical, we're following the normal things and we're doing what you expect. If I get angry, I start to be a little erratic. You know, I make slightly less appropriate or less probabilistically likely choices. We literally call it temperature. When I get angry, I feel like my temperature goes up, so it feels, feels somehow OK. But it does allow the system to wander further from the, the strict probab probabilities it's learned. And so I've given it a nice high temperature, and I've got to put my mouse over here. And go, I'll make it a little faster. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the next Jason Sherman play. I hope you're <laughs> excited. Um, so it's making up words, right? It's, it's beyond the range of what is a possible. <laughs> yeah. So that's quite a high temperature. The color is representative of the temperature. I'm bringing the temperature down a bit. It's going to make a little more sense. Uh, bringing the temperature down. But as I, what, youngest grit, that's a good word. As I bring the temperature down, it will start to normalize, but it will also have fewer choices. So there's always this trade-off here. And this relates to something that I think is really important and interesting about these models. And it was something I forgot to raise when we were talking about bias. The, the most profound bias in AI systems is a bias towards normality. Right? These are statistical systems, so they, they're particularly nuanced in the normative space. And they become less. Uh, nuanced as they get further from that. And that's a really profound and very general kind of bias that I think is extremely important because I don't know about you, but the most pivotal points of my life have all been low probability events, right? Mm -hmm. Like we are most profoundly influenced in our lives by very low probability events. And I don't want to live in a space where the low probability events disappear because they're so low, we don't care about them. The normative reinforcement is, the, I think, the most dangerous bias in AI systems. So temperature allows you to stray from that normal normative bias. Lowering the temperature brings you back to that, but narrows the range of possibilities, narrows the creativity. So it's, we like, really like in the lab to play with these sorts of parameters to understand how it changes the behavior of the system. When you play with ChatGPT, you're usually given it in a version that they've already decided is OK. But there's lots of flex under the hood that they don't want you to touch because it leads to strange places. OK. 
and strange places are very interesting places, as I think we all this agree. Lama. This is not Llama. This is this this is GPT two. I have not changed to Llama. No, no, no. No, I can show you Llama. I don't have the Jason Sherman version of Llama here. Um, Llama is just like a, a much more potty mouth chat GPT that will go anywhere instead of telling you that it's, it can't really talk about these things. Um, do we want to play a game here? Do we want to chart our way through a... Okay, so Mark, this character Mark, who I don't know, throw a... I'm going to raise the temperature a little bit so we see more options. And we're going to choose the options. We're going to navigate our way through, um, through the space, what's called in this case the latent space of the model. So um, what a system learns based on all the stuff you give it is a latent space, a field of possibilities. It's usually a uh, million dimensional space. We find it as humans impossible to imagine million dimensional spaces. What's valuable to about a million dimensional space is unlike your, your closet, where if you want to put something, you can always, you know, we can move it up, down, or the back, but you've run out of room. In a million dimensional space, you can move it you know, sideways, up and down, back, but there's always another direction. You can move it mm, as well, and if that's not enough, you can move it another one of a million different ways, which is why, in a sense, these latent spaces can hold so much and yet be at one thing. So we're navigating the latent space here the latent space of Jason Sherman's writings. And that's what we're doing. We're navigating. We're not writing, we're navigating it. So throw a right. I'm going to raise the temperature so we wander a little wi wi wider. I'm going to go back a bit so we can rephrase. Throw a plum. What do we want? Throw a... Who wants to... I'm going to pass this mic around, and yeah, then yeah. If, if you get the microphone, yep. you have to pick yep. the word. You, you have, go, yeah, if you have the microphone, you have to suggest the next uh, word. Thing. Fact. Throw a fact. Okay, I'm going to have to come up to, here we go. Throw a fact. Okay. Who's next? Pass the microphone. Throw that. a fact. Yeah, Throw that. a fact check. No, who? Uh, oh, fact check. Sure. Oh, check. check. Fact check. Proceeding into proceeding into. I've got the temperature high enough that there's a lot of possibilities. I'm scrolling upwards through into. So now you'll notice it's almost we would almost all choose weather after that into weather, right? There are certain things in our own use of language where things narrow, the probabilities narrow and widen. If I say, I, I went, what's going to be next? Two. I went two is a very high probability thing. Language in itself and the way we use it has this sort of probability scape as well. Police. Into police. Reports. Police reports. Please, unions. As you can feel, I, I think you should, we, want to, we want to feel all the possibilities flexing as we're moving through these words, too. Okay, police reports. Period. Uh, which period? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next. Remember? Remember. Remember. Hour. Remember hour. 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 Remember. There we go. Beaver. <laughs> Situation. <laughs> Some of those are, are dark, so I can help you. Uh, so I wear last from here, yesterday, today, and a bunch of punctuation. Um, yesterday. Yesterday. 
Whoops, what's it do? It doesn't want to go to yesterday. What's going on? It's refusing to go to yesterday, sorry. <laughs> I think that's just a bug in my code. Um, from? From. Alberta. Oh, sorry. Alberta. From Alberta. Question mark. <laughs> Anyone? Familiar. With those stories, where middle. Interesting, a lot of choices after where. Okay, yep. Management. <laughs> and. Hand, okay, middle. Sorry, I didn't, and, okay, yep. Uh, cops. Shake down, shake down. <laughs> Think of. Now we're getting, it's not a limited number of words, but the thematic is really focused. Men. Trying. 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 It's only one choice here. I'm going to take it as a freebie. Okay. Anyone else? Squeeze. Squeeze. Okay, we're going to, we could do this all day. We're not going to. <laughs> we're going to stop here, but I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to take a last moment to say one of the things that we've done with models like this, just take it out of this exercise. We, uh, we originally, when we first got GPT-2, we trained it on the predictable things like Shakespeare and uh, the Greek tragedies and things like that. But we, we were working during COVID with some of the best Shakespearean actors in, in, in Canada because they didn't have anywhere else to go. And we would do the live streaming of like this, up on, without this part, up on the screen. And they would live perform this uh, on the fly, and it was amazing. And one of the reasons it was amazing was even though this is kind of well-structured nonsense, there's not a long arc of story, the performers reading this with a pause, a look, a gesture, a way of clustering on stage would give meaning back to it. And it was a really extraordinary experience of the role of human interpretation in making these things make sense. There's something we always have to keep in mind when we're trying to assess the quality of what it's putting out there. Anyway, thank you. Okay. It's uh, my job to wrap things up here. Uh, I really want to thank all of our panelists today, Ingenuity Labs, really uh, inspiring, interesting conversation. Uh, we'll remind all of you, um, 
We're in the middle of Fold Up. That means there's art things to see down at the Isabel Bader Center for the Performing Arts. If you want to see Smart, Smart tonight, too bad, it's sold out. Uh, but you can still come and see Lucy AI. There are tickets available for Smart, Smart uh, still on Saturday afternoon for the matinee. And there's another performance, Mashup, which is looking into uh, artists who have disabilities working in the circus arts. They're doing some really interesting stuff in the air in the recital hall. So uh, more for all interested to check out and thank you so much for attending the startup.